But um, we are back in Hebrews chapter 11. And in the sermon, I'll mention some things having to do with uh, the new year. But we are back to our sermon series on faith, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 20 to 22. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Before the break for Advent, uh, we, I, we spent four sermons on Father Abraham, on Abraham's faith. We talked about his call, his receiving the promise of a son, sojourning in the land, and the test that came to him with regard to his son Isaac's life. Would he step forward and give back to God the blessing that God had given to him? Now that Advent is over, we have to remember the lessons and the truths of Abraham they carry over. They carry over to us now, but they carry over as well to those who would follow in Abraham's line. Because Abraham marks the beginning of the new family, the nation that brought the Messiah to earth. So we move on from four sermons on Abraham to one third of a sermon each for Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now, their, uh, their lives were incredibly interesting uh, I have preached sermon series, I, I think on Joseph for sure, but each one of them, uh, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, each one of them could merit a sermon series, but the writer of Hebrews underscores for us a common element in their lives, so they all fit together in one sermon. It's a sermon that's three times as long as all the, no, it's just one, one sermon. So what is that common element? Uh, it is that they lived and died in faith, always looking forward to the fulfillment of God's promise. They finished well. And so we're going to talk this morning about finishing faith. Because they finished well, we are in their death. So let's consider Isaac's faith from verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Now, the last time we saw Isaac, he was on Mount Moriah with Father Abraham, and he was prepared to be sacrificed. The Jewish rabbis had great reverence for Isaac. They wouldn't call him just Isaac. They referred to him as faithful Isaac. In cooperating with Abraham's desire to obey God, Abraham was old. Isaac was young. Isaac could most likely have overpowered Abraham, and he could have certainly outrun him. But in a great act of youthful faith, he allowed himself to be placed upon the altar, and he waited for the knife to fall. Youthful faith. Hebrews fast-forwards through Isaac's life to that moment when he gave his blessing to his sons, Jacob and Esau, as he himself was approaching death, a death that he would not be saved from. All die, with a few rare exceptions. If you know the Jacob and Esau story, Jacob the younger tricked his blind father, Esau, into giving him the blessing of the firstborn. Uh, not Esau, Isaac. There we go. His father was Isaac. His brother is Esau. And... Uh, he left, Jacob took the largest portion of the blessing and left the much smaller blessing to his brother Esau. It was a lie and a trick on Jacob's part. It was an injustice to Esau. Yet somehow, God had woven that into his plan. I know that Esau wasn't the most, uh, he wasn't the wisest person, but to say that there wasn't some injustice done to him would be wrong. But why would Hebrews emphasize this action of a stolen blessing in the line of faith? Here's why. Here's why I think it does. Uh, the world is full of conniving people. And you can meet some of them at church. You all laughed a little too quickly on that. But God's plan and God's truth 
It just keeps marching on. You see, God's plan isn't going to be stopped by evil people, and it's not going to be stopped by people in high religious places or uh, supposedly good people who mess it up. And we do, from time to time, mess it up. God's truth keeps marching on. Isaac lived all of his life believing in the promise that had come to Abraham. He had seen a miracle. He had heard the voice of God when God pointed out the ram that was caught in the thicket. He knew, Isaac knew, that God's plans could not be thwarted because he had heard it from his, fa his father Abraham. And in his blessing, he did the best that he could. Now, he was not pleased that he had been tricked by Jacob. He was fully aware that he had unknowingly participated in an injustice toward Esau. But after it was done, there was nothing that he could do about it. Circumstances and people had conspired against him to bring about a situation that he would not have chosen. In your life, you can only control so much. God gives you responsibility for your actions. And while you can try to influence others, every person has free will to do as they choose. But God is never boxed in. God is never checkmated. And Isaac knew that. Isaac had the sense that God was still going to work out his plan, even though the blessing of Esau went to Jacob. Isaac knew. He knew that somehow God was going to work, and he finished well. You know, in our lives, uh, we all are in different circumstances and different situations, and I have known people in my life that have tried to do the right things forever, and their family got in the way, and circumstances got in the way, and it just it didn't turn out right. It didn't turn out well. Money that people had thought was going to missions was stolen and taken from them, and there it went. And I've listened to them, and I've tried to encourage them as they came to the end of their life that all is not lost, that God knows. It's the same thing whenever I talk about stewardship, and I talk to people about giving to the church, and I, I tell people this. Don't do something more than give to the church. Give it to God. Give it to God. Because we're going to pray as the elders and the people of the church, we're going to pray that God helps us to spend our money wisely and well. Does that always happen? No. Even good churches sometimes mess it up. And then there are churches where money gets embezzled. You ever known of that? I've known of church that have, churches that have lost many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wouldn't it be great to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to you know, and then they lose it. And I want to rem and they think, oh, it's all lost. Everything I'd planned got God's work in a bigger plan. Let me tell you something. It wasn't stolen from the church and it wasn't stolen from you. It was stolen from God. So he'll take care of it. Trust that even when things don't seem to work out, if you are walking with the Lord, he has a bigger and better plan. If he can redeem us, he can redeem those odd and strange little situations. Consider Jacob's faith. I'm behind, aren't I? There we go. Jacob's faith. By faith, Jacob, the conniving guy who took the birthright. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Jacob did not live an easy life. Jacob paid for his duplicity with his father many times over. Read his life. Things were difficult. Jacob was getting his. But by the grace of God, God's promise to Abraham was renewed to him. As a reasonably prosperous man with a large family, his heart was, a, was broken by the apparent kidnapping of his son Joseph the oldest son of the two sons that his favorite wife, Rachel, gave to him. You know, in Christian circles, we don't usually hear that phrase, favorite wife, do we? Things changed over time. We'll talk about that at another time, but anyhow. 
Through God's grace, Joseph went to Egypt into prison and finally rose to prominence within Egypt's court, becoming the second in command to Pharaoh. What a miracle. And that was happening. And Jacob didn't know this. His son, Joseph, was gone from him. And the move from being sold into Egypt as a slave to becoming second in command of the nation is so improbable that we can't even think about it without labeling it a miracle. Well, we know the, we know the rest of that story. Jacob does find out where Joseph was and they are reunited in Egypt. And it's a beautiful, beautiful moment. As Jacob's death approached, Jacob made an interesting decision. Prompted by God, when he gave his uh, dying blessings to each of his sons, he did not give a blessing to Joseph. He's the one that should be blessed the most. Why aren't we blessing Joseph? No. Uh, He gave Joseph essentially a double portion of blessing by setting Joseph aside and pulling his sons forward, Ephraim and Manasseh in the family blessing. See, Ephraim and Manasseh weren't brothers. They were nephews of the other other, uh, leaders of the tribes. When people with biblical knowledge speak of Joseph's sons, the order is always Ephraim and Manasseh, although Manasseh was the oldest of the sons. And they do so because God has a great sense of irony. It's just amazing the way God works. Just as Jacob, the younger son, received the blessing of the older son, Esau, so Jacob was led by God to give the blessing of the oldest to the younger son. We read in Genesis 48, And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right, toward Israel, Jacob's left hand, and Manasseh on his left, toward Israel's right hand, and brought them close to them. Joseph knew He wanted his oldest son to get the right-hand blessing and his youngest to get the left hand. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger, and crossing his arms. He put uh, the left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. And then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, The angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. In that blessing, Jacob, or Israel as he is called here, reaffirmed his faith in God's promise to the family. God has made us a promise and he's made a promise of a great family and we are in that line. this family that is now in Egypt, but destined for the land that was promised to them. And Jacob reaffirmed his faith in God, even when it ran contrary to the human conventions of his day. God is going to make both the tribes great. Ephraim and Manasseh will both be great. But by his sovereign will, the tribe of the younger will be greater. And that's exactly what happened. And we see here a little bit of God's sovereignty in choosing. Ephraim became one of the leading tribes of the nation. And when we name the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Israel, Joseph, as a reward for his faithfulness that saved his nation, gets double mention in Ephraim and Manasseh according to the will of God. And Jacob finished well because he continued faithfully in the family of faith. Joseph's faith. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. Great literature, isn't it? He gave instructions about his bones. When Jacob died, Joseph took his body back to Canaan, to the promised land, and buried it there. That was Jacob's wish. Waiting for Jacob were the bones of Abraham and Sarah, his grandparents, his mother and father, Isaac and Rebekah, 
and his wife, Leah. And when Jacob was buried there, it was one more person symbolically staking their lives on the promise of God. That burial was a continued faith marker of the family. These people believed that uh, they believed God so much. They believed that he was going to deliver their family out of Egypt and bring them into the land of the promise, a land of promise. So that's where they put their cemetery. And in Joseph, there's one more generation of believers who inherited that promise. Now, Joseph could have had a place in the royal cemetery of Egypt. He was a hero to the nation as he had saved them from starvation in the great famine. But that wasn't for him. He believed in something greater than earthly prominence. Far greater in his eyes than any wealth and prestige that pagan Egypt could give was what the eternal God had in store for those who, like Abraham, simply believed what God said and acted like they believed. How did they act like they believed? Well, they were buried in their homeland, a place that they didn't live and a place that they didn't own. Instead of a great funeral of state, he chose instead a simple piece of unremarkable ground. He wanted his bones to be driven six feet into the promises of God. So by faith, Joseph spoke about the exodus from the country that had been his home. He had left Canaan when he was 17 years old and he died in Egypt when he was 110 and Egypt was never truly home for him, even though it was a wonderful place of protection for him and all of his family. And so according to Joseph's instructions, when about 300 years later, when it finally came time for God to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, they had a logistical problem. They had to carry the mummified remains of Joseph with them. They didn't just take Joseph up then, they kept him on ice or mummified. Exodus 13, 19 reports, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear on an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. And Joseph's bones stayed with them a long, long time. Through all of Moses leading, through all the desert wanderings, 40 years of nomadic life, they had to make sure that they didn't forget Joseph's bones. Joseph was not buried until all of the tribes had received their inheritance. Joshua 24. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. Abraham and Man or, um, um, Ephraim and Manasseh, in their, uh, in their inheritance, received portions of that cemetery. 400-year-old bones. Now, it's easy to say 400, but remember, like, the United States, we're just over you know, 30, 40 years, over 200 years uh, in age. For 400 years, they carted and they had possession of Joseph's bones before they buried them. What a statement of faith. I talked earlier about Abel, whose blood still speaks. Even though he is dead, he still speaks. What does it say about a man who says, I want you to have my remains with you, take my bones? What a testimony. Joseph's bones are still speaking as he looks and has looked towards the promised land and said, I'm going to believe the promises of God. That almost applies itself, doesn't it? What is it that God has promised me? I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to believe it I'm not going to be around to believe it after I'm dead. God's going to take care of me there, but my bones are going to testify because I have made you swear an oath 
to bury me in the land that God will promise. As Moses later will write the history of the nation, Abraham, of course, but then Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and on and on, Moses sees them finishing well. He sees them leaving a legacy of faith, a legacy of faith that isn't looking backward, just believing what God has done, but looking forward, believing what God has promised. What legacy do you plan to leave? I hope it's a legacy of faith. Family, kids, friends, I'm looking forward to what God is going to do because the future is going to be far greater than anything in the past. And when reading through these verses, you kind of feel the weight of family faith. Isaac looks to the promises made through Abraham. Jacob calls Ephraim and Manasseh to be included as sons first of Abraham and Isaac and then of himself. Joseph remembers the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's a lot of years, a lot of family faith. Now, you may have been blessed to come from a family that includes or has included many generations of Christians. And if that is the case, rejoice in that. And don't you dare let it end with you. Don't let them down because they have prayed for you. Or maybe you're the first true Christian in your family. How blessed are you that you can turn a family line toward truth and eternal life? I have great reverence for my grandmother, my, uh, my dad's mom. Uh, she was the first in her family to become a Christian. And through her testimony, she turned a family line. She turned a family line. I inherit the blessings of her faith. My children inherit the blessings of her faith. Fortunately, there were some Christians that married in as well, but uh, uh, she did something wonderful. And if you were here and uh, you are the first Christian in your family, what a blessing. You can turn your family line to follow Jesus. Your descendants count on you. And they count on you to be a faithful witness, and they count on your prayers. Your finishing faith, which Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph embodied, your finishing faith can be a beginning faith for the generations that follow you. So here we are on the precipice of a new year. And I pray that we all live in faith that perseveres, that has about it the quality of finishing faith. Now, hopefully we don't all finish this year. You know, I mean, we, we want to keep rolling on here unless God has chosen that this is the year when we all get to finish. I'd, if that's not the case, I'd like you all to hang around for a little while longer. And I really do believe that God has plans for us. And so in the coming year, we want to encourage each other to value most the promises and the plans of God. And as Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Hey, there's the church attendance plug, but I'll leave that alone. Uh, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We are made for eternity. That's one of the reasons that the promises of God span far more than the period of our lives. We occupy a portion of the span and we're called to be faithful and it matters more than we know. That's why it's also a mistake to think that your life is wasted if you can't find some great ultimate purpose and thing to do. Because remember, God is working everything out. Wherever you are, even if you think it's low and menial and not amounting to much, if you are a person of faith, it's doing something great. It's beyond what you have a, a reason to know. Live for Jesus and let him do great things with your life. Beyond what we can see, God's promises to us will still be fulfilled. And I believe their fulfillment is greater than anything we can imagine. So let that be your encouragement in the new year. God wants us to do something a lot more than merely hang in there. Let me tell you something. 
if we lived in a place where merely hanging in there was all that we could do, then that's God's will for us. And I think of prayer requests from earlier in the service. Just got to hang in there. But here we are. We have the privilege of doing more than just hanging in there. God wants us to fill our lives with the worship of him and the work of the kingdom. And it's an exciting time to be alive. It truly is. I didn't get one amen over that. You must not have enjoyed Christmas presents or something. I'm going to say it again. This is an exciting time to be alive. Amen. So I'm going to see you back here next year, and we're going to get to work. And that heart and that attitude and that faith is the faith that will finish well. Amen.